So, moving on. So, when you start bringing in many atoms close to each other and start creating solids, you could end up with different kinds of arrangements. Okay? And depending on the, if you classify them in terms of their order of arrangements, you end up with things called as monocrystalline or crystalline solids, polycrystalline solids or amorphous solids. Okay? And what are these? Crystalline solids are solids where the atoms are arranged periodically throughout, which means that for infinitely long distances, there is complete periodicity in the arrangement of the complete regularity in the arrangement of atoms, the perfectly well arranged. Okay? So, if you look at the distance between these bonds, it is all the same throughout. Okay? Okay, so, for example, this bond length will be the same between one plane to the other, that bond length will be the same from one plane to the other, etcetera. And in fact, they form such a nice grid of points that we could define a vector system or a uh, coordinate system on this grid. So, if you, if you were to define basis vectors, let us say A1, A2 and A3 for a three dimensional space, then any point on the any crystal or lattice point. Okay? So, this crystalline arrangement is something called as a lattice and any atom occupying a lattice, uh, any lattice point uh, which is basically an atom in the lattice can be defined uh, using these three uh, uh, orthogonal vectors. Okay? So, it is a linear combination of these vectors where you have alpha 1, alpha 2 and alpha 3 are constant coefficients and this vector r is basically a linear combination of these orthogonal vectors. So, it is a very geometrically pleasing structure. The polycrystalline structure is a little off in the sense it is not that perfectly crystalline. The polycrystalline structure in fact has got little tiles that are perfectly crystalline within the tile and the size of each tile is the order of microns. So, let us say 10 microns. And you have different tiles which have got which are within themselves crystalline, but the, the type of crystallinity changes. So, for example, the orientation of the crystalline planes will be different. Okay? So, for example, within this little tile, the structure is perfectly crystalline, but the crystallinity holds true only for this distance of about a few microns. And then you have an other tile that starts and you have a different uh, nature of crystallinity within the other tile. And these tiles are all separated, these tiles are all called grains and these grains are all separated by grain boundaries. Okay? So, this is something called as a polycrystalline material. And if you go to the other end of the spectrum, so if we had crystalline and then we have polycrystalline which is somewhere in the middle. The other end is a completely disordered structure, which is there is almost no periodicity at any scale length. And even, even if there is periodicity, it is only of the order of few atoms long. And this is something called as an amorphous material. Okay? So, a classic amorphous material is glass. Okay? So, these materials are also called glasses. So, in amorphous materials, the atoms have no periodicity whatsoever. So, the bond lengths between the different atoms will be different their bond angles will be different and so on. Okay, so, it is a very extremely defective uh, structure and, uh, and it has got immense consequences with regards to the distribution of energy levels and you know the nature of band gaps etcetera. And in our course, we will look at crystalline materials. Okay. Now, it is helpful for us to study the uh, the geometry of these crystals. So, for example, let us study the distance between two crystal planes, which let us say is called D. Okay? Now, a very powerful experimental technique to do that is something called uh, as electron diffraction from a crystal or which is also called as Bragg's diffraction. So, what is done is the crystal is placed inside a system and the system 
puts out a very high energy electron beam and makes it incident on the crystal. Let us say you have two rays of this beam. Okay, so, let me just uh, draw this a little better. So, you have an high energy electron beam that is made incident on this crystal and two rays of this incident uh, and these uh, of these beam uh, tend to diffract because they are passing uh, through this uh, difference in the two lattice planes through this gap here which has got a width of d. So, these electron beams are going to diffract and by placing a screen we would obtain an intensity pattern due to this diffraction and by looking at this intensity pattern one can identify whether this material is truly crystalline, what the crystal spacing is etcetera. Okay. So, firstly let us just break down this entire experiment. So, firstly why do we need a high energy electron beam? Why cannot I just use visible light to study the distance between uh, crystal planes? So, the crystal the distance between crystal planes of the order is of the order of few angstroms. Okay. So, let us just say 1 e minus 10 meters. So, that is the order of the distance between the planes. But visible light has got a wavelength which is about 4000 angstroms to about 7000 angstroms. So, it is about thousands of times larger than uh, this distance. So, it is not possible for this large wavelength electromagnetic wave to resolve such a fine distance. And therefore, we need to use an electromagnetic wave which has got a wavelength of the order of 1 e minus 10 meters. And how is that done? It is done by using an electron gun for example and firing the electrons off at very high momentum okay, because if you add a lot of energy to the electrons you increase the energy implies you increase the momentum and due to Bragg's law if, an inc if the momentum is increased the wavelength of the electrons will go down. And therefore, we can get very small wavelengths by having very large momentum in the electron beam. So, you use high energy electrons to study the crystal plane. So, this high energy electron is made incident on this plane. So, let us say the angle of incidence here is theta. It is not the angle of incidence, but uh, it is the angle at which it glances off the plane is theta. And you have your another ray which comes in like this. Okay. Now, these two rays are going to interfere and create this intensity pattern. Now, what is the condition for constructive interference? So, if you have let us say one wave that looks like this and another that looks like this. So, let us just mark two points on this, let us say A and B. So, since the peaks which are defined by A and B are at the same location, we could say that these in waves would interfere constructively. But now, let us say we translate the second wave, we translate it by half a wavelength down. So, B now comes to this point. So, this is down by half a wavelength. Now, clearly the peak of this wave is at the same location as the valley of the other and therefore, you will have destructive interference. So, now if you translate this wave a little bit more by another half lambda, the peak of this wave has now shifted by another lambda by 2 and therefore, the distance the total translation has been 1 lambda that is 1 wavelength and you will again have constructive interference. So, you have constructive interference only when the path difference between the two waves or the if you want to think in terms of phase difference is also ok, but the path difference between the two waves should be an integer times lambda. It is only then that you will have constructive interference. So, what is the path difference between these two rays? 
So, let us draw a facet here you know which is sort of perpendicular to this and another facet or another plane here which is perpendicular. So, till this point both these rays travel the same distance exact same distance and beyond this they are going to travel the exact same distance to the screen. But it is only this this way this ray has traveled a little more than the other in this region. So, this is the path difference this is the path difference between the two rays it is only this little distance here and what is that distance. So, we just use trigonometry to identify that. So, we have this little structure and this is the path difference. And the hypotenuse of these two triangles is d the crystal plane difference and you can easily find out that this is theta and therefore, this point this distance here is d sin theta and that distance there is also d sin theta therefore, the total path difference is 2 d sin theta. So, the condition for constructive interference is that 2 d sin theta be equal to n times lambda ok. So, that is that is given here. So, this is the condition for constructive interference and this is something called as the Bragg's condition. So, by keeping this crystal inside the system and by impinging an electron high energy electron beam on it and by changing the value of theta one can get an intensity versus theta plot ok. And from that plot it is possible to identify whether the material is a crystalline material uh, and you know if it is then what is the distance between the planes and etcetera. So, it is a very powerful tool to study crystals. So, now coming to the defining the crystals themselves ok. So, we will just go through a few definitions. Uh, it is not really fundamentally important from the point of view of this course, but nevertheless it is useful to know these things. So, let us say you have a two dimensional crystal lattice as shown here ok. So, let, let me make something that is uh, that is simple in case it is not visible. So, let us say you have a two dimensional crystal lattice. Now, what are the different ways in which I can define this crystal space ok. So, the first thing is to identify the most fundamental structure. Uh, that can define this crystal space and there are two ways to go about it. The first is to define something called as a unit cell ok. So, what is a unit cell? A unit cell is essentially any building block that is composed of making a polygon let us say out of the out of these lattice points such that when this building block or when this geometrical entity is repeated again and again it can be used to fill up the entire lattice plane without having any gaps etcetera etcetera ok. So, this entity can be used to fill up the entire lattice plane. So, for example, this could be a unit cell this could also be a unit cell. So, both these are possibilities for a unit cell. So, a unit cell is not unique you could have many unit different kinds of unit cells. So, that is what a unit cell is and if you want to locate the number of atoms in a unit cell you know how many atoms are present in a unit cell what we have to do is we count the number of atoms and also watch out for the number of unit cells that are sharing those atoms ok. So, let us do an example and then uh, it will become quite clear. So, let us take a unit cell of this kind ok. So, it is uh, you have you have a unit cell which has got a structure like this. So, this can be periodically used this can be used again and again to completely cover the entire lattice space and your lattice space is composed of all these atoms which are drawn as these little solid circles. So, let us take this uh, unit cell let me just fill up uh, the space 
all around so that it becomes easier. So let us take this unit cell. So if you need to find out how many atoms are present in that unit cell, we see that there are 4 atoms in the vertices and there is one atom right here in the middle. So therefore, it appears that there are 5 atoms but then we need to be careful because this atom is already shared by 4 unit cells. So this atom is equivalent to one fourth of an atom because it is shared by 4 unit cells. And how many of these kinds do we have? We have 4 such corner atoms. We have this one, we have this, we have this and here. So we have 4 corner atoms, vertex atoms and each of them are shared by 4 unit cells and therefore they are effectively 1. But there is one in the middle which is shared by just one cell right which is which only belongs to this particular unit cell and it is not shared by any cell. So it is only belongs to that cell and therefore there are total of 2 atoms in this unit cell ok. So that is the way you calculate the total count and I think if you practice this you will obtain it uh, you will get better at this but uh, it is really not really important for this course but nevertheless uh, it is good to know. Now the other definition is something called as a primitive cell and what is a primitive cell? A primitive cell is simply the smallest possible unit cell ok or if you want to quantify it the number of atoms in a primitive cell has to be 1 ok. So for example if you go back to our lattice we defined our unit cell uh, as that and the number of atoms were 2 because there were 4 here and there is 1 in the middle so this cannot be a primitive cell. A primitive cell has to be something smaller, it has to be the smallest possible unit cell and that is possible by having a unit cell that looks like this for example. So if you have a unit cell that looks like this, how many atoms does this unit cell have? It has got 4 in the corner but these 4 are shared by 4 other cells and therefore there is a total of 1 atom per unit cell. So this is a good definition of a primitive cell. So once again if you were to take a primitive cell and tile up all the primitive cells next to each other you should be able to fill up the entire lattice space. Now heading towards 3D, so if you go from 2D to 3D there are different kinds of lattice structures ok and they can be classified into very distinct types ok and there are basically 5 distinct classes for 2D lattices and there are four, 14 distinct classes for three dimensional lattices and these are called as the Brave lattices. So some simple structures ok which is uh, useful to know for 3D are something called as the simple cubic, the body centered cubic and the face centered cubic ok. So what is a simple cubic? A simple cubic is simply a cube with the atoms all sitting on the vertices of the cube ok. So now if you have to go through your example and say identify the number of atoms, so this is a one, this is one kind of a 3 dimensional unit cell. So what is the number of atoms in this 3D unit cell? It is you have 8 atoms on the vertices but each of these atoms are shared by 8 other unit cells and therefore there is one effective cell per simple cubic unit cell. What about the body centered cubic? A body centered cubic is got 8 vertices just like the simple cubic structure but it is also got one atom right inside, inside the body and therefore the total number of atoms are going to be 8 into 1 by 8 plus the 1 which is not shared by any other cell, so which is 2. And the third is a face centered cubic structure which is basically got your 8 corner atoms just like a simple cubic but then on the center of every face you also have one atom present. So this is a side face and you have one that is a face uh, on the table that is another and so on. So what is the total number of atoms? So if you think of this face atom it is going to be shared by 2 unit cells. So you will have both these unit cells sharing that atom. So you have 8 corner atoms shared by 8 unit cells plus 6 face atoms shared by 2 unit cells and therefore you have a total of 4 atoms per uh, face centered cubic unit cell. 
Now, particularly with regards to crust uh, silicon, which is uh, going to be our model of study, what is the silicon structure like? You know, just to just to give you an idea. So here is a typo. So you, uh, let's ignore that structure for now. Although the general geometry is correct, um, it looks like there are different kinds of atoms there. So silicon structure only has silicon atoms, and a simple way to draw it is it's 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 basically two face centered cubic structures which are sort of interwoven. Okay, and we will uh, I will explain that. But a simple way to draw it is to simply draw a tetrahedral arrangement of atoms, and then continue drawing tetrahedral arrangements of atoms. So you'll end up with a diamond structure, and then this will have its own uh, this will have its own tetrahedron and so on. So that's the way you could you could possibly draw a silicon lattice. But then if you think of this picture here, okay, so what this picture tells you is you are looking at the silicon unit cell from the top okay. and these numbers that are written here are pointing out that there is an atom in that x and y. So, let us let us keep this as the y coordinate and the x coordinate. So, you are seeing the x and y coordinate of the cell and this number here is the z coordinate of the system. It is telling you the height of the atom from the floor. So, if we had to draw the say z, x and y, what this is telling you is first let us look at these, look at these 5 atoms. Okay. So, it is telling you that you have 5 atoms sitting right on the floor and they are like a face centered cubic arrangement. And then let us look at these atoms which are on the sides. So, now we can construct the side walls that have got a certain height and there are atoms sitting at the midpoint on these walls which are the on the side faces and this roof of the cell is basically the floor of the next cell. So, this structure repeats. So, this is at 0, 1, the roof would be at 1 and therefore, it is a face centered cubic. You see the first face centered cubic, but there is an also some other atoms that we have not yet counted. So, now let us look at these atoms here, the 3 by 4, the 1 by 4. If you were to sort of continue these atoms, you will find that you know this arrangement can be extended throughout. And these are your other interwoven, uh, what do you say, face centered structures. Okay. So, you have these two interwoven arrangements that form your silicon lattice. Okay. It's, it's good to just spend some time and imagine it. What we talk about now is something called as a packing or the effectiveness of packing in a crystal. And in particular, we define a factor called as a packing fraction in a crystal, which tells you, uh, which gives you a ratio of the volume occupied by the atoms to the volume of the unit cell. Now, the unit cell, depending on the kind of a uh, unit cell taken and depending on the size of the atoms and the and the kind of um, and the kind of uh, packing of these atoms it is possible that there are some spaces in the unit cell or the volume of the unit cell might be larger than the effective volume of the atoms or you know the unit cell might be very efficiently packed. So, how does one determine uh, you know this kind of uh, the packing efficiency in a unit cell? It is given by this packing fraction. So, let us just take an example and uh, by just solving this example you, you know the message of this uh, 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 packing fraction would be very very clear. So, let us take a face centered cubic. So, what is a face centered cubic? You have a cubic uh, unit cell, you have 8 atoms on the vertices and on the center of each face you have a uh, separate atom by itself. So, how many atoms do we have in this unit cell per, uh, per unit cell? You have 8 corner atoms and each of these 8 atoms are shared by 8 other unit cells and therefore, it is 8 into 1 by 8 plus 6 face atoms and each face atom is shared by two unit cells and therefore, to 6 into 1 by 2 which is equal to 4 atoms. So, there are a total of 4 atoms per unit cell in the face centered cubic crystal. 
But now instead of just drawing the atoms as little dots, let us actually define a radius for each atom. So, let us say that the each atom has got a radius which is uh, which has got a radius of r. So, the volume of each atom is 4 by 3 pi r cube and that there are a total of 4 atoms an effective number, 4 effective number of atoms per unit cell and therefore, the total volume uh, of the atoms occupying this unit cell is 16 by 3 pi r cube. Now, so let us uh, draw this picture here. So, here is the top face of the cube. So, let us say the top face of this face centered cubic structure. So, you have one atom there and that is the next uh, face centered cubic structure. You have another atom here, you have yet another atom there, you have yet another atom here and that is your uh, crystal structure. So, you are seeing the top of everything. So, if you look at only this unit cell, you find that it is packed in this particular manner. You have one face centered atom okay, which has got, a, which has got a, a diameter 2r and you have all the other corner face centered cubics which are being shared uh, which have all got an effective radius of r. Now, therefore, given this definition of r okay, and given that all these atoms are not touching each other and they are they have all packed into this unit cell in this particular manner. Can we define the length of the uh, of this square? What is the what is this length a? Okay. So, what is a? a can be easily defined in terms of r and you find that your a is nothing but 2 square root of 2 square root 2 of r and therefore, the volume of the unit cell okay, which is basically a cube of uh, uh, each, uh, each side having length a is a cube and a cube can be defined in terms of r because of this relation. So, you find that the volume of the unit cell is 16 square root 2 r cube and therefore, the packing density is the total volume of the atoms occupying this unit cell divided by the total volume of this cube and it turns out to be about 0.74 for a face centered cubic crystal. So, that is something called as a packing density. Okay. It is again something that is not going to be useful in this course, but having said that it is quite important because uh, it determines. So, let us say this is the face across which you are going to have all your electron transport. Okay. So, let us say this is the face of the semiconductor on which you are having electron transport. So, this packing fraction determines the nature of the interaction of the electron with the crystal. So, the surface of the crystal and the arrangement of atoms on the surface of the crystal where the electron is going to move across mm. does definitely impact the properties of the uh, charge transport properties of charge transport and therefore, determines the current etcetera. Now, we now come to the last bit of the course and before we just drop off okay, I just want to define three ideas. Uh, the, these ideas uh, are again something that we will not be using in the rest of this course. So, it is all right for the students to completely skip these three, but I feel that these are three critical ideas that provide a deeper insight. Okay. Now, the first idea is basically a geometrical construction okay. and it is something called as a Wigner Zeit cell. So, let us say you have and how do you, how do you perform this geometrical construction? So, let us say you have a lattice. Okay. So, let us say these are the atoms of your lattice. Okay. Now, let us take any one atom in the lattice. So, let us take this particular atom here. We will first draw lines okay, as shown by these dotted lines. We will draw lines that connect this particular atom to the nearest neighbor. So, these are the nearest neighbor atoms and we are simply drawing lines that connect this atom to the nearest neighbors. So, that is the first step in this geometrical construction. Next what we do is we will draw the perpendicular bisectors to these lines. So, let us take this particular dotted line. So, what is a perpendicular bisector? It is the line, it is another line that divides this line into two equal parts and intersects it at 90 degrees. So, we have that to be the perpendicular bisector to this particular line. So, we now construct perpendicular bisectors to each of these dotted lines that connect the atom that we have chosen to the nearest neighboring atoms in the lattice. 
So, we have all these perpendicular bisectors that are shown here and these perpendicular bisectors would all intersect, they would all meet each other. You see these bisectors, so you see this bisector is meeting this one, this bisector is meeting this one etc. And all these perpendicular bisectors will therefore enclose a certain space. You see that is that is if you if you were to draw this enclosure, so which I am going to draw with this very thick line here, they would enclose this certain space, okay, and they would basically create a cell. Okay, so this enclosure by all these perpendicular bisectors creates this kind of a cell, and this cell is something called as the Wigner-Zeit cell. So you started off by taking picking an atom, drawing lines to the nearest atoms constructing perpendicular bisectors and taking the inner shell that that is enveloped by all these perpendicular bisectors. So, this is something called as a Wigner Zeit cell, it is simply a construction, a geometrical construction. So, that is the first, first idea, okay. Now, this connects to another idea. So, the second idea is something that has got to do with the reciprocal lattice space. Now, very simply put, you know, do, do not worry about all these, uh, this mathematics here. Okay, I will tell you what that is, but do not worry about it. Reciprocal lattice space is essentially a frequency space. So, let us say you have a periodic crystal, you have got, you have got atoms arranged in some period. So, it has got a periodic wavelength, it has got some spatial period to it. Now, what is the frequency? It is essentially 1 by the spatial period. So, if it is A, 1 by A could be considered to be the frequency. So, if you were to take the spatial Fourier transform of the real space, you will end up with the in the frequency space and that frequency space is called as a reciprocal lattice space. So, it is essentially a Fourier transform that connects the real space to the frequency space, okay. So, that is essentially the idea behind what a reciprocal lattice space is. Now, if you have a crystal, if you have a perfect crystal in the real space, and you take a Fourier transform, you will end up with an other with another periodic arrangement of uh, points in the reciprocal lattice space, and that will also be a crystal. Okay, although it need not be the same kind of a crystal. And the way you translate between real space to reciprocal lattice space is if you were to define basis vectors in the real space, say uh, a1, a2, and a3, such that any lattice point in the real space is a linear combination of these three orthogonal basis vectors. Then the reciprocal lattice space will also have basis vectors b1, b2, b3 and they will all be connected to the real lattice space vectors in this particular fashion, okay. So, essentially you will find that uh, in the 3D case it is basically this cross product divided by the volume of these cells, okay. So, it is a very brief introduction to reciprocal lattice space. If you were to take these two ideas, you have the Wigner Zeit cell and you have the reciprocal lattice space and the reciprocal lattice space. So, Wigner Zeit cell was construct was a geometrical construct constructed on real lattice space. So, you took lattice, you had these lattice atoms. So, we are talking about real space which means x is measured in meters, okay. And we constructed a Wigner Zeit cell by drawing all these perpendicular bisectors in real lattice space. And then we defined something called as reciprocal lattice space, which is also a lattice, but it is all in 1 by meter, okay. So, it is all the frequency domain, it is the spatial frequency domain, it is the dimensions are all 1 by meter, okay. And you have constructed a, another lattice here, which is a reciprocal lattice. Now, if you were to apply the same geometrical construct in a reciprocal lattice, that is you construct a Wigner Zeit cell in a reciprocal lattice, that enclosed boundary is something called as a Brillouin zone. Now, the reason why I am introducing this topic is that these Brillouin zones, you see these are all perpendicular bisectors, okay, to these 2 pi by a, 2 n pi by a lines. And therefore, this Brillouin zone facets occur at points where we are now in k space, right? We are in k space. We are all at, uh, you know, uh, 1 by meter, that is the reciprocal uh, or the frequency, spatial frequency domain. So, we are all in k space. 
So, the Brillouin zone boundaries occur at points where k is pi by a, 2 pi by a and so on where integer times pi by a. So, that is where the Brillouin zones zone boundaries occur. Okay, we are, we are, I am only talking about linear spatial thing, uh, linear arrangement of atoms. So, if the Brillouin zone boundaries occur here, have we seen these points anywhere else? So, we have seen these points somewhere else and those were the points where the energy gaps occurred. So, when we drew the E k diagram after solving Kronig's penny model, we saw that the energy gaps or the discontinuities in energies occurred at pi by a, 2 pi by a etcetera. So, therefore, the discontinuities are all occurring at the Brillouin zone boundaries and it so happens that the entire idea of this energy gap formation can also be explained by considering the diffraction of electrons uh, at these facets. Okay, so, electrons reflect off uh, these zone facets and therefore leads to the formation of energy gap.